Christine is an herbalist and author. She lives in Virginia. And as I mentioned, her book was just released yesterday. So I will let Christine tell you a little more about herself. Thank you so much for being here, Christine. We're really grateful to have you. And I'll just turn it over to you. Thanks for having me, Giselle. Thanks. What a kind introduction. Hi, everybody. Um, what a nice contradiction to the isolation and quarantine we're all experiencing right now. It's so wonderful to be together. Um, as Giselle said, my name is Christine Buckley. I'm an herbalist. I'm a community-based herbalist, which means that I really help people think about how to use herbalism in their everyday lives, um, in the routines that we already have set up. So how we feed ourselves and people we love, how we take care of ourselves and our homes, um, everything from what we do in the bathroom to what we do in our bedrooms to what we do in our kitchens. Um, this is what community herbalists think about, uh, particularly how we do all these things in partnership with plants, which are living all around us. If you are somewhere on planet Earth, you are surrounded by healing plants, um, a lot of them culinary and healing at the same time. So my book is Plant Magic, Herbalism in Real Life. This is it. We're going to be talking about two plants that are featured in the book today, and um, that is thyme and chamomile. Um, I think one thing that's handy about this situation, even in its uh, not only discomforts, but also like very how scary it might feel and sad, um, we're all learning what it's like to practice new routines from not touching our face um, to, social, to distancing when we're with other people to um, just kind of like changing how we're interacting with the world also means that there's a lot of opportunity for us to kind of slip in good, good habits to develop good habits. Um, so one of the things that we can do is implement routines that support the systems in our body that keep us healthy, like our immune system, support our respiratory system, and su support our nervous systems, um, because all of these things work together to keep us healthy, and when one suffers, they all suffer. Um, this is another idea in herbalism that everything is connected, and that when we think about our health and when we think about taking care of ourselves, we think about it holistically. So um, as we are you know, washing our hands for 20 seconds and doing all these new things to kind of keep ourselves healthy and keep our communities healthy, there are lots of ways that we can bring plants into these moments. Um, and one of my favorite things to do is a time steam a facial steam. I, um, I work on a farm every day during the week in the morning and so I'm around people and then I come home and I have a hot time steam to help clear my resp respiratory system, to get into my nose and into my throat, into my lungs, and to create an unhabitable environment for pathogens. That's basically what doing a steam does. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from the book about thyme because it's a plant that we can find commonly in the gardens that we grow or the farms that may be nearby us or also in our kitchens. Um, you can use dried thyme or you can use fresh thyme for any of the recipes that are in the book and also for most recipes that you might find elsewhere that aren't in my book. Um, but let me see. It's, I have to say, it's strange for me to be talking here in this kitchen with no one around, but I think it's fine. Um, so let me just gather my thoughts for a second. Okay, time. Um, time is really useful for, that's so kind. Someone's saying I'm doing a great job. That's really nice. <laughs> um, so there, something that I talk about in my book is I mean, basically the whole book is how do we as just like regular people bring more plants into our lives. Um, we've done a lot of work to move our species from outside to inside. We live and now all of us are spending way more time, time in our homes. Um, so 
it can be, there's lots of obstacles in our modern world to connecting with the natural world um, of which we are a part. And it just so happens that so much of what's out there is also in here. We just don't really think of it that way. Um, our kitchen cabinets are filled with medicinal plants. Um, most of the plants that you have in your kitchen um, coriander, cumin, cinnamon, thyme, rosemary, oregano. Um, these all help us digest our food. Um, they alleviate any kind of discomfort that might come with digestive issues. So um, they're, all, they're also, not only do they help our, our digestive systems, many of them are really good for our lungs, which is true about thyme, also true about oregano, also true about rosemary. Um, the, the, the oils in these plants are effective not only in our digestive system, but also in our lungs. So thyme, going back to thyme, um, there's, what I did in my book is to set up for every plant kind of a little guide at the beginning that tells you when you should reach for it, the sensation of the plant. So that means like your literal senses, how you experience the plant in your body. Um, the flavors of the plant, where it lives, which means like where outside you might find it, and then which parts of the plant you should gather, and then the what are called, what I call super strengths, which in herbalism talk is plant actions. Um, I'm trying to find my time. There it is, found it. Okay, so in the box for time, it says, reach for this when you have a wet cough or you have a sore throat. So not only are we dealing with COVID-19 and I'm, I'm not gonna go into herbal, um, recommendations for that virus because we don't have any data and I don't feel comfortable talking to you about that specifically. But what I can talk to you about is being at the end of cold and flu season and also at the beginning of allergy season. Um, when we are experiencing things like runny noses, post-nasal drip, um, wet coughs, uh, these are all symptoms of what we might at least in my part of the country, which is in Virginia, um, our spring is like really just getting into gear. So the cedar trees are pollinating, the grass is growing. Um, I'm a person who experiences allergies. People I love experience allergies and these wet conditions are what develop in our bodies that we can use um, healing plants like thyme to help remedy. Um, so I will say if you are going to participate in the things that we're going to do together, which are do this time steam and do the chamomile eye packs, then get your pot of water on for the time steam. I have, I'll show you my pot of water. Um, there it is. It's like a big pasta pot. And I put about four inches of water in it. And I have it on the stove. I have mine going because I wanted to be able to show you how to do it. Um, and I just have it on low. So if you wanna get your water going while we're talking, if that's safe for you to do, then you can either do the, the steam with me when we get to that point or when we get off of this, this Zoom, I was gonna say call, this is absolutely not a call, um, then you can do it, then you can do it yourselves afterward. So get your pot of water on and then you'll need either a handful of fresh thyme or a handful of dried thyme. I have dried thyme, it's nothing fancy. Um, it's just regular, regular time. Um, and you can also use regular time if you have it in, if you have it in a tub or in a tea bag or wherever it is, or in your garden, go get it, get a handful, bring it back. We're going to use it to do the time steam. So, um, time is a teeny tiny plant. The leaves are very small, but it's really powerful. It is, it is stimulating and also a relaxant. It uh, is antimicrobial, it's a nervine or a nervine, depending on where you are in the world. It's an expectorant, a carminative, which we talked about being a kitchen plant, helps us move gas through a system, calm the digestive process. Um, a rubefacient, an, an amenagogue in large doses, a decongestant, an antispasmodic, an antiseptic, and a nutritive. So this is a really dynamic plant. There's a lot of punch packed into these tiny leaves and stems. Um, 
it's it's in our kitchens because it gives us a lot of nutrition and it also gives us eases a lot of discomfort. It eases physical discomfort, discomfort and also emotional discomfort. So this situation in which we currently find ourselves is stressful. Like it's super stressful. We don't know what we're doing. We're distanced from each other. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of overwhelm. Um, people are sick. Some people are dying, like there's a lot going on. So our stress is really amplified. And I don't think that that's uh, anything to, to look over. We really have to think about how to support the places where we're able to find moments of peace and moments of rest and moments of connection. So something like a face steam is not only good for you physically and physiologically, but it's also really good for your nervous system. Um, and if you're at home with your family and you're trying to find activities to do that aren't going to like erupt in disagreement or some kind of, you know, um, conflict because we're all spending a lot of time together, like this is a really relaxing thing to do together if it's done safely because there is, you know, there is boiling water. So we have to remember to be safe, but it's relaxing. It's physically and emotionally relaxing. And um, it's a great activity to integrate into our group and to the routines that we have throughout the day. So, um, so time is warming and usually in these conditions that are damp, they tend to be a little bit cold. So it's nice to have something that not only warms up the condition, but also dries it out. So that's what we're looking for from time. Um, the volatile oils are really the microbial agents that work to clear pathogens from our digestive system or our um, respiratory pathways. Um, it's really good at moving things. So what happens when we have allergies is like things are constantly dripping because your immune system is like, Bleh! there's just a, there's just like constant wetness and things get kind of stuck. So time's really good at moving things along. You can think of it as kind of like a gentle pusher. Um, let's see, is there anything else I want to tell you about it in particular? I'm just using the book as a guide. So, so that's time. I think I'll, I think I'll conclude with time there. And then I imagine that everyone's water is still boiling. So maybe we'll just move into chamomile and we can talk about chamomile. Um, so chamomile is another common plant. Um, I think I said before that, uh, that I specifically chose plants for my book that you can find anywhere. Um, the United States is a country that is populated by people from all over the world. So we have plants from all over the world. Some of them, some, some of them cause problems, plants, not people, um, for the natural environment. And some of them are, you know, native and need to be supported and not to be picked. So most of the book, most of the plants in this book are non-native species and are widely available in um, not only like come in your yards, but also in grocery stores and in corner stores and in gas stations and bodegas, like airports. That's something that I love about chamomile is that it just like shows up everywhere. It's on the back of a shelf somewhere in the dollar store. And it's also in, you know, fancy upscale grocers. It's everywhere. Um, and let's see, I guess I'll just go through, I'll just go through the little table again that's in the beginning of the book, which looks like this. I've, it has like this, you can see the table. Um, okay, so chamomile, reach for this when. You want to relax the nervous system, calm an aggressive fever, ease gas and bloating, soothe hot rashes or other skin conditions. So um, we're gonna be using the chamomile tea bags. If you have, a, if you have chamomile tea bags, you'll, you'll need two. If you have loose chamomile, that's also gonna work. You'll, you'll just need like some kind of reusable napkin or cloth in which to wrap up two separate little packs that you can put on your eyes and also that you can submerge in hot water to get things going. Um, so let's see, chamomile is mostly neutral. It's sweet like an apple with a bitter aftertaste. 
Lots of people think that chamomile tastes like hay water. I used to be one of these people. It turns out that I never had good chamomile before. So um, yeah, uh, let's see where it lives. Sunny fields, grazed grasslands, gather this. Flower tops hold stronger healing power, though tea made from the stems and leaves is still beneficial. So lots of commercial chamomile is gonna have leaf and stem in it. It's totally fine. Don't not use it just because now you know that. Um, super strengths, antispasmodic. So like time, it relaxes us. It relaxes places where we're gripping and spasming and it just helps us chill out um, physically and emotionally. It's anti-inflammatory, digestive, nervine or nervine, diaphoretic, which means it helps to release a fever, carminative, anodyne, helps with pain, relaxant, and it's a bitter. So, um, after we, after we set the chamomile bags and water so that we can put them on our eyes, we'll be able to drink the tea. And so you can kind of see what it tastes like to you. And we're, we're going to steep it a little bit longer than like usual. So maybe you'll begin to understand some of the bitter flavors. Um, so one of the things that I like about chamomile that I said already is that it's everywhere. Um, the, it, it's, it's really good for places where we're like, I have a, I had a teacher, my teachers Katya and Rin at Commonwealth Center for um, Holistic Herbalism in Brookline set, they have this story that they tell about having a client come in who's like, and da 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 da, and da 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 da, and I just can't figure it out. And I can't handle anyone else telling me that I need chamomile. And, it, and the thing that Katya always says is, so we gave her chamomile um, because when we're feeling that way, when we're like feeling kind of desperate and like exhausted and just we've had it up to here, chamomile is a really great way to just take it down a notch, notch to help us like collect ourselves, to ground again, to notice where we are. And then from there to make decisions about how we want to work to support whatever it is that needs support in order to move through the thing that's driving us a little bit bonkers. Um, let's see. It's so so the situation I just described would be energetically one of heat. Um, things are fired up. Like this is an energetic state of heat. And so when you're feeling emotionally heated, chamomile is really appropriate. And it's also really good if parts of you are heated. Um, so if you have inflamed, swollen eyes, like maybe you have a sty or you got something in it and it irritated your eye. Um, if you have a hot skin condition, like either a rash or you got a sunburn, um, a mild sunburn, if you get a serious sunburn, definitely seek medical attention. Um, let's see, what else do I wanna tell you about chamomile? Um, Oh, a thing that I write, this is handy to remember, chamomile is my favorite remedy for what I call the leave me alone, don't leave me alone feelings. When we feel like it's easy to feel like you don't want any help and you just want everyone to go away when you're feeling overwhelmed, when really the answer is to figure out how to connect with people and reach for people and invite people in. And not just people, but also plants. Um, if we're consumed by this mission to keep everyone out and like maintain distance and just be alone, then it can get really hard for us to even figure out like what we need. And it's important to remember that in order for us to figure out what we need, that we need, that we're going to need help, um, either from people or from plants. And chamomile can kind of help you take that first step to get a little perspective on what's going on. So then you can think better about okay, maybe it's something in my digestive system, or maybe it's something in my immune system, or maybe I'm actually not getting enough sleep. Like chamomile is a great first step in any problem solving situation. Um, so I guess that concludes my spiel about chamomile and time. And then I can show you how I like to do the time steam and how I like to do the chamomile eye packs. And then we can I'll do that together um, or whatever. You can just watch and then you can do it when we hang up. Um, okay, let me get these things out of the way. So if you're doing this with children, um, 
you want to make sure that you're putting the pot of water in a sit in a space that's stable and safe for them to be able to, to like back up and give themselves space. So I'm going to do it right on my counter next to the stove. I'm going to turn, bring the water to the boil, turn it off, kind of get your space set up and then move the pot of water, um, you know, onto a towel or whatever you want to use so that it doesn't burn your counter if you have counters that are going to get burned. Um, so I have my, I have my pot of water kind of at waist height. It's on a stable surface. And when I open the top, a lot of steam is going to come out. So make sure that you don't have your face right over it because that will be at best uncomfortable and at worst burn you. So just give it a little bit of space. Um, Ta-da! <clears throat> and then you're going to need a towel. I just use my bath towel or if you have like a light weight blanket or a bathrobe, whatever you got, really. It just needs to cover your head and then the pot so that the steam stays in and you get a full face of it. I'm going to grab my towel. So here's my towel. The water is hot. You will not have to reheat the water throughout this process. It's not necessary. Um, make sure you have a hanky nearby or like a Kleenex or paper towel because things are going to get moving. Remember we said that about time that it gets things moving. That's what's, that's what's about to happen. Um, my mascara is going to run and I'm going to look like a whole new like warm and mossy person, but just stay with me. So take a little bit of time. If you have a bunch of fresh time, um, you could kind of trim it with scissors as you dump it in uh, or chop it on a chop it with your knife. I'm going to pour probably like a quarter to a third cup of thyme leaves into my hand. I'll show you that much thyme leaves. I'm going to dump it in. I'm going to put my head over the pot and I'm gonna put the towel over my head and over the pot. And I'm gonna make sure to stand far away at the beginning because I can always come closer. It's a lot harder to start, or well, it's not a lot harder. It's just as easy to start closer, but it could potentially be more dangerous. So start far away. You can always get closer. Um, remember, you can open and close kind of the curtains that your towel makes to let the warm air out and cool air in. So. You can control the temperature. If you're doing this with a kid, um, I would advise not putting a towel over their heads. Just let them interact with the steam kind of in whatever way they want to. Maybe they just want to put their hands over it. Maybe they want to like dip their head in and out. Also, if you're an adult, cool if you want to do that. Um, okay, so I'm going to go in and then I'll see you once I've been time steamed. Bye. Okay, I'm going to tell you what I'm doing, which is I'm breathing slowly and deeply. I'm breathing in through my nose and out through my mouth. I'm breathing in through my mouth and out through my nose. Um, I'm making sure to pay attention to when it feels too hot, when it feels too cold. Um, and I can already feel it like really calming my face. And really after just like three breaths, I have to say talking to you guys on the internet is like, very exciting, but I'm also like, <laughs> so I should have done this before because now I feel a lot calmer. Um, <clears throat> so that's it for a time steam. You can use your pot of water. This pot of water will last like, you could go in and out two people, probably six times each. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, and then your sinuses will start going. You might cough, so make sure that you have your hanky or your tissue nearby, like I said. Um, oh, yay, people are doing it. I'm so happy you're doing it. Um, <clears throat> it's such a great thing. And also, like, if you don't have time and you're like, what do I use in place of time? Think of, remember that and ask it in the, the Q&A at the end, and we can talk about what you might have and um, what it might be good for. Um, so that's time. 
<sighs> Feels so good. Um, and then let's do the chamomile. Um, let's get our chamomile bags ready. So, oh great, rosemary. I love rosemary. It's also in the book. We can talk about rosemary in the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to move my pot over here. So even right now, like I'm putting the time away, um, I'm going to probably do a time steam when we're all done. I'm just going to reuse that pot of water. I wouldn't reuse it throughout a day, but, um, you know, within like a couple of hours, that would be fine. Um, <clears throat> and also, if you, not to get like too graphic, but if it doesn't cause too much to move and really all that's happening is you standing over this pot of time, water breathing in and out and nothing falls into the water, then you can drink the, you can drink the tea, you can drink the thyme tea, um, or you can use some of it in a broth or, you know, so long as it's not contaminated, um, I, I wouldn't reuse it, but if, if I would drink that, um, so think about doing a time steam, time steam every time you come back into your home right now in this period that we're in. Um, if you go to the grocery store and you're around a bunch of people, if you have to go to work and you're around a bunch of people, um, then come home and do a time steam. Do it in the morning, do it in the night. The more the, more the better, really. Um, especially if someone in your house isn't feeling well, everyone should be doing it. Um, if, they, if you have any kind of wet cold condition going on and if you're like what is a wet cold condition um i'm using energetic terms which i describe in my book um we're really all of us are totally able to do herbalism we just need to get re reacquainted with the vocabulary and with the plants and then we can begin to understand how to do these things every day in our homes with um just ourselves or with the people we love and live with um so yeah do a time steam do it all the time and then the chamomile, I'm gonna use a mug. And so I bring chamomile tea bags with me everywhere I go. There, I have one in my wallet and I also have them stashed in my like overnight, you know, where I keep my toothbrush kit. Um, when I travel, it's incredibly helpful to have something calming to drink because I get flight anxiety um, and I also get digestive disruption in, in relationship to that. So chamomile is, um, it's moistening, it helps my, digest my digestive system, it helps me calm down. And then the added benefit is the tea bags I can use as eye packs in the same way that you might use cucumber. So if you travel or, you know, if you travel and you're tired and your eyes get red and dark under eyes. Um, if you eat like really salty food or have too much to drink and you're puffy, chamomile eye packs. Um, if you have, you know, like I said, an insect, an insect sting or you have a sty or, or any kind of, um, uh, you know, like irritation on your eye, chamomile is going to be a very gentle remedy. So I have my two bags in my cup. I'm going to pour hot water in. I should have done this while I was talking to you, but I think it's okay. Um, I might just speed it up to, I might do like a, like a cooking, you know, the trick where like you make the thing and put it in the oven and then it's ready just like that. We'll just pretend that these are ready. So if you were doing this, I would recommend that you steep your tea for about seven minutes. So you're going to end up with a medicinal dose of tea, which is going to be really great for everyone to experience what that tastes and feels like. Um, <clears throat> so you want to let it steep in the cup, these two bags. And then when it's done steeping, I would get a little plate and set the bags on the plate because they might still be warm and too warm to put on your eyes. Remember that your eyes the skin there is sensitive and delicate. It's not like the skin on our hands. Um, so what feels, what feels not too hot to our hands is gonna feel very different on our eyes. Um, so I'm gonna let this cool down. I'm actually just gonna stick it in the freezer. 
I'm like so embarrassed that you might see the inside of my freezer. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna stick in the freezer, which you can also do at home. You could put in the freezer, you could put your bags in the refrigerator. I think it's nice to have them like a little bit warm. I like that. But if you want something like really extra cool, just cool down the tea bags in the refrigerator or the freezer. Um, yeah. I'm like, as I'm waiting for them, what else can I tell you about chamomile? Oh, okay. So we talked about routines coming, coming back into our homes from the outside world when we may have been in contact with people in this particular moment that it's a good idea to do a time steam. The other thing is that um, it's really important right now that we're all thinking about basically like the pillars of our health, which would be our sleep, our relationships, joy, food and water and exercise. Um, all of those things, when stuff gets stressful, go completely out of whack, at least for me. All of a sudden I'm eating more junk food. All of a sudden I can't sleep as well. All of a sudden I forget to exercise. So we can use plants to remind us to do those things. Um, we don't even have to like get into a big discussion about what exactly those things should look like for each and every one of us. Like, Sure, we could talk about that, but we could also just talk about figuring out ways to actually do them because sometimes that's the baseline. It's just like getting to sleep. So um, I noticed that when I don't want to have a cup of tea before bed, that means that I need to have a cup of tea before bed because it means I'm having some kind of resistance about going to bed in general. So if I can kind of prepare myself for having to go to sleep and then I can say, okay, well, two hours before or one hour before sleep, you can have this cup of tea. And it doesn't have to be a huge exploration of my sleep pattern and like what's happening in my brain when I'm sleeping. It's just like, I'm just going to do this one thing, which is to have this cup of tea, chamomile. And then at the same time, I'm going to put these things on my eyes. And so for five minutes, I'm going to relax. Maybe I won't even think about sleeping. I'm just going to take some time to slow down. Um, so... I think these are probably ready. Yeah, they feel good. So um, if you feel your time, your, your time, your chamomile bags, they're a little bit slippery. They're like slimy. And that's the demulcent quality. That's the moistening quality of chamomile. Um, chamomile has this, cinnamon is demulcent, marshmallow root, which you may have heard, heard people talking about lately, um, linden flower chickweed, lots of things. Um, so then you just go like this. And chamomile is dripping all over the place. And it feels really great. <laughs> um, and you can use your towel that you use for your time steam. What I would do if I was you is I would lay down, I would put a little like Kleenex on my cheeks and maybe on my forehead or like a little reusable towel that's just going to catch the dripping. Um, demulcent is spelled D-E-M-U-L-C-E-N-T. Um, I just happened to see that. So with the tea bags, lay down and then put them on your eyes and then lay there for as long as you can, not doing anything. And then when you're done, drink your cup of tea, which I'm going to do right now. Um, and if the rest of you made the eye packs, then I've probably been talking for enough time where you can take them out of your tea and you can put them on your eyes. And then while we're having Q&A, we can drink our tea together, which would be so nice. Um, I think, I think I'm ready. For, I think I'm done. I think I'm ready for questions. Great. Hi. <laughs> I always want to be here just so you have a face to look at, but I want nice. people to be looking at your face and not mine, but um, there are many audible giggles that audible for me, not for you. Um, thank you, Christine. You are exceedingly lovely and that was wonderful. Hey. Um, lots of positive, <laughs> lots of similar feelings in the chat, but if you're ready for Q&A, we'll jump right in. It's yeah. Kind of the perfect, perfect size. So if you guys have more questions, go ahead and put those in there as we're talking. Um, but we'll, I'll kind of reverse engineer these questions and start with the chamomile questions. Okay, um, great. One is, do you have any tips on growing chamomile? Um, chamomile does, so before I moved to Virginia, I just moved here about a month ago, and before that I lived in Detroit, and before that I lived in Brooklyn for 12 years. Um, 
do not try and grow chamomile in containers. It doesn't work <laughs> <work> well. <laughs> chamomile really needs um, a lot of space and needs good drainage. So that's why you find it in fields and that's why it does well on farms um, and in people's yards. But it, it doesn't do so well in containers. I've failed miserably. I had some friends who had um, some good luck growing on their rooftop in kind of like much larger containers. Um, but yeah. Oops. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we have one more person wondering if you have any uh, favorite tea brands, favorite brands for buying that tea. Yeah. Um, so I love traditional medicinals, which was, which is a chamomile blend that I just, just their organic chamomile. They also make, I tend to be, so I talked a couple, a few times about energetics, um, which is a concept that we can all explore and understand. I explain it in my book, but I tend to be energetically dry and cold. So um, I like the traditional medicinal chamomile ginger blend. And then I also really love this blend called Nuit Calm, which comes from a different country. Um, and it's linden, chamomile, and orange blossom. And I think it's a delicious blend. Um, but in general, if you have anyone near you that grows culinary and medicinal herbs, that is the best place to get high quality plants. Um, and also to engage in your local economy and your local ecosystem and to learn a lot from the farmers. It's the best. I've learned the most buying from people who grow the thing. Excellent. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of um, folks, small, smaller batches, but you can buy things in bulk. And I live in Oregon, so I like to get my stuff from Mountain Rose Herbs. She's just a few hours away from me. and. I love that. So I find the small producers and the folks who are taking great care with what they're growing. Yeah. Or grow it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and somebody is asking if you can use the leaves from the chamomile or just the flowers. And I think you mentioned to throw the leaves in. And I, I'm wondering if you can answer that question with sort of many herbs. Uh, is there, a, you know, with the thyme, should I break it all up with the stem or do I really want to take the leaves off the stem and uh, using the whole plant versus just the leaf or just the flower? Yeah. One of the exciting things about herbalism is that um, you get to zoom in on things. So you learn really quickly that different parts of plants do different things. Um, and it's not true for all plants across the board, but like, let's see. So mo like for flowers, for something like chamomile flowers, most of, the, most of those phytochemicals are concentrated in the flower, but they're still in the whole aerial parts of the plant. And usually you'll see a direction for the aerial part of the plant or the root part of the plant. And in general, if people just say aerial part of the plant, then it's anything above, of, above the ground. Um, something like thyme that has a woody stem, if you just you know, crush the leaves in your hand and then also crack the stem, you're gonna see that the leaves are oilier. So then that's gonna to indicate to you that there's more action, there's more medicinal action in the leaves because it's actually the volatile oils that are providing much of the antimicrobial, um, much of the stimulating action that we were talking about earlier. So it really changes plant to plant, which is why it's handy to have a book to guide you and also many books because different people will talk about plants in different ways that communicate to you more effectively or help you remember better. And it's also good to just cross-reference. So is that helpful? Okay, good. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think a lot of these things, like you're mentioning, they grow in fields and they, um, I don't know if it's the best term to use, but it can be foraged or you can go find what you want. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that of picking things. Um, I actually yeah. did a workshop once and there was, we had a great conversation about not taking too much. Like mm -hmm. how, how can I forage for things and look for things and what's the best way to sort of sort of be kind to the earth um, and take care of it and make sure the systems are sustained, but also take home what I would like. That's a great question. I love talking about foraging and wild crafting. Um, <clears throat> there, there are so many things to talk about. We could have a whole hour long thing about wild crafting and foraging, so I won't talk about it exhaustively, but um, the, the root, like the meaning of the word herbalist is two things, either someone who studies plants or someone who peddles plants. 
So an exciting thing about being an herbalist, which just because you're not a person who educates people about plants doesn't mean that you're not an herbalist. If you are studying plants, then you're an herbalist, you're practicing herbalism. And um, just in the way that the more we study plants, we understand which parts of them work differently in our bodies or like which parts are more medicinal, so too do we understand how they propagate and how they reproduce and how that can affect whether or not we should take them from the wild. Um, and then which parts of them we should take from the wild. So that's the first step is to kind of get, take the initiative to educate ourselves about how plants live, what their life cycles look like, and then to understand that some parts of the plants um, reproduce and other parts don't. So when you harvest the root of something, that's it. That's it for the plant. When you harvest the flower, then you're also taking the fruit that might become seed. If you're taking the leaf, that might be okay. Um, and you know, each individual gets to come up with, gets to make their own decision, but there's so many great resources to educate ourselves. So, so that's one thing is understanding how plants live, um, which means how they reproduce, but then also in what environments they live so that you have an understanding of where to find them. Um, and then that also, if you know where one plant lives, then that can tell you if maybe another plant will live there. It's like a really great way to trace different species. Um, and then, and then the most important thing is to go outside and to spend some time just watching. I advocate for people watching a place that they want to harvest for a year, at least. I think it's important to see who else is coming there. And I mean, who else by like birds, butterflies, animals, other people. Um, and I assume, I'm, I, I assume we're talking about just like foraging for ourselves and not commercial wildcrafting. Like that's a, that's also another topic, but um, most of the plants in my book are common invasive species um, or non-native species. We have different feelings about those terms. That's a whole other thing too. But um, like something like dandelion, dandelion, pick away. Every single part of that plant is useful medicinally and, cul and culinarily and they, reproduce super well. Um, so part of it is fig like chickweed right now, dandelion. A good thing to do is just like identify the weeds that show up everywhere and are just gonna keep coming and coming and coming. Most of them are super nutritious and that can kind of like scratch the itch to forage while we're learning about other plants or learning about an ecosystem. Um, it's just important to take our time, I think. Excellent. When I first started farming, I did done a little bit of farming in the past and somebody once said to me, it's only a weed if you don't want it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is a yeah. really nice perspective. <laughs> this is yeah. a pesky weed thing, but it's like, she's like, oh no, it's only a weed if you don't want it. Otherwise it's just a plant that's available yeah. to you. <laughs> yeah. so I kind of love that. Um, and great to use them if they, if they grow so prolifically. So sure. that covers some things we can forage, and you mentioned that chamomile needs a lot of space and isn't great for containers. Are there herbs that you mentioned in your book that are good for containers if someone has smaller space or a yeah. porch or something? Yeah, um, so uh, thyme is great for a smaller space, mint, lemon balm. Um, I'm like, I should just go down the list of my, I don't know, what, for a small space. Okay, basil. Basil's not in the book. I'll just focus on what's in the book. Mint. Um, you can grow catnip in a window. I've grown catnip in a window. I've grown lemon balm in a window box. Um, rosemary does not work out so well in containers. Uh, you know, being in the Pacific Northwest, I'm sure you have seen like how big and beautiful rosemary can become. Um, it, it, rosemary also needs a lot of space and well-draining soil. Um, let's see, what else grows well indoors? I'm like, um, most of the culinary things, parsley, cilantro, and all of these things are still medicinal. Um, they're going to help you digest your food better. They're going to help you assimilate nutrients better, make everything more bioavailable. Um, and then there's also, you know, topical applications for most of those plants too. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, a question about what happens with the plant after it flowers. Does the effectiveness in the way that we're using it today or that you mentioned in your book, does it change at all if a plant is flowering? 
Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah, different plants. So um, again, it's like there's not a hard and fast answer to that question. The thing that came to mind was nettle, which is in the book. Um, and because when nettle flowers, then there's more of this phytochemical after it flowers and goes to seed that, could, that gets released into the leaves that can be harmful to our kidneys. Um, and I don't want to scare anyone about it. Like, you don't have to be afraid of nettle. Um, but, it's, but it's important to know what happens at different stages of a plant and when you're supposed to use which parts of a plant. Um, so time, you know, something like time after it flowers, it's fine. But, um, and the wonderful thing about thyme or rosemary is so much of its activity is in the leaves and those leaves are so rich in oils, they're evergreens. So they're good all year round. Um, they're, you know, in the winter time, energy comes from the periphery of the plant down into the ground. So in the fall, we're talking about root medicine and the think about, think about the season that you're in. And then that can tell you about which parts of the plant are going to be useful for you, um, whether you're cooking with it or whether you're using it medicinally. So um, most of the time if the plant's flowering, like it's, it's fine. If the aerial part of the plant is what you're supposed to be using. Cool, excellent. We have a couple of questions about some specific herbs and so we somebody mentioned rosemary that they wanted to try the the steam with rosemary um and another another asked if that's a good substitute for thyme if they have yeah. that right now yeah so um <clears throat> i'm gonna take a sip of my chamomile tea <laughs> um all of these like rosemary oregano thyme the kind of like more wild the Monarda bee balm. Um, what else? We'll stick with ro we'll stick with the rosemary, thyme, and oregano. Those are all good for like resp respiratory, like bleh, like thick, slow, um, thick, slow feelings in your respiratory tract, meaning like in your throat and in your lungs. It's gonna help move everything up and out. Um, also, like pine, pine needles, white pine any cedars, firs. Um, <clears throat> the difference between rosemary and thyme is that I find rosemary to be more stimulating and more clarifying. So thyme is like, if I were thinking about when to use thyme and when to use rosemary, I think I would use thyme when I'm looking for a plant that will not only relieve whatever physical sensations I'm experiencing, but is also going to help me calm down. Um, rosemary is more invigorating. So if I come home and I'm tired from work, but I have to keep going, then I would do a rosemary steam. Awesome. Yeah. And someone asked about eucalyptus and using it in during showers, if that's just trendy or if it has medicinal benefits. Yeah, it's uh, eucalypt, the actions of, um, so you could either hang, you know, fresh branches. I know in California, there's just like so much eucalyptus. Um, and then often people grow it commercially. If you're gonna buy eucalyptus, same thing for roses. If you're buying any plant from someone who's not like a medicinal herb grower, ask them if they've sprayed it um, because you don't wanna use those plants medicinally. Um, you can put them in a vase and put them on your table, but you don't wanna hang them in your shower. You don't wanna eat them and you don't wanna make any kind of topical or internal application out of them. So, uh, yeah, eucalyptus has many of the same activities as thyme or rosemary or oregano, activating our respiratory system, helping us expectorate from our lungs. Um, it's also really calming. And like all of these plants have this really interesting dual capability of like simultaneously relaxing and stimulating, which is um, really as like modern people in this world where we kind of have to like keep going much of the time but remain calm through all of it these plants are really helpful excellent that's the magic i guess yeah <laughs> really part of the magic yeah, for sure <laughs> right. i'll ask you one more question before we wrap it up and that is do you have any tips on if i have something like one of these things growing in my garden how to dry it how i might preserve it and then how long 
that it sort of maintains its potency. If somebody has had chamomile or dandelion flowers that they dried last year and is wondering if they're still potent, if they were stored properly, how long can I keep it and still sort of get the benefits out of it? And how do I keep it if I'm growing it in my garden? Yeah. Um, so one of the benefits of studying herbalism, which you all can do, is that you learn how to make medicinal preparations which extend the life of plants. So a good general rule of thumb for dried any plant, whether it came from your garden or you bought it at the grocery store and it's living in your kitchen cabinet, is that they should be used within a year. That's the general time frame. But if you learn how to make a honey, make a tincture, make a syrup, um, make an oil, then that means that you could have that plant from anywhere to six months to a year longer than you thought you could. So um, learning preservation techniques in medicine making is a really great way to keep your plants around longer. And then also I talk about in the book methods for like drying plants, which is good to know. Um, one of my favorite ways to do it is to lay plants out on window screens because the air can come through and you can either set that aloft on just like two step stools or two chairs or on a drying rack. Um, and it can take, it can take a few weeks for plants to dry, especially if you live somewhere that there's more humidity in the summer. So it's important to check them and they should snap, like not bend and then break, they should snap and then they'll be dry. Um, you can also dry on a really low oven that you keep open or a dehydrator. When I lived in New York, I was part of a medicinal herb CSA and I just got like so many plants every week. So I would get up at like 4 a.m. before it got too hot in my apartment and just dry calendula flowers in my oven, like took like 20 minutes, um, but then it would be done. And then I had these beautiful bright calendula flowers that I didn't have to worry about going bad in my fridge because that's really what you don't want to happen is have to throw away plants that you gathered or someone gave to you, but you weren't sure how to make them last longer. Um, Cause that's really heartbreaking. That's happened to me. Yeah. Same as food, same thing, find a yeah. way. <laughs> Thanks so much, Christine. You are wonderful. We really appreciate your time and good luck to all of you out there with your new activities and stay well, stay healthy. Thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. I'm good. so glad you got a new series. Yeah, thanks a lot.